Hey, it's Brian. Quick note about this week's episode. The sixth book is Heaven is a Playground by Rick T. Lander. Promise is going to make sense in about 34 minutes or so. All right, enjoy the show. This is The Other 51. I'm Brian, and this week I'm talking with Leander Sherlockins, a lecturer at Marist College and columnist for Yahoo Sports. First of all, congratulations. We were just talking before we recorded. Congratulations on finishing this semester and on getting through what had to have been a crazy semester for all of us teaching. It was a long, weird, strange semester, and I, I hope we don't have another one like it. Right. So how many classes do you teach at Marist? Uh, three in the fall, four in the spring. I teach uh, sports reporting every semester, pretty much. I teach a sport culture and communication class and issues in sports media class. Uh, a class I created called Center Field, which is a kind of a practicum where our students um, cover Marist Athletics, which is Division I, um, as a class. So basically they go out and report um, a story surrounding the one of the varsity teams every week. And, and they sort of produce that and put that up on the website. And in the fall, I've got a new class uh, that we've created called Sport and Social Media, which should be interesting. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. So um, mm-hmm. from, from teaching, uh, especially teaching sports writing, because I found my own challenges on this, but I love talking to you about it. What was, what was it like teaching sports media and sports reporting courses when there's no sports going on, especially that practicum course where they have to produce content and they're used to covering games or doing stuff like that. But now all of a sudden that content, well, like that threw me for a loop for a few weeks. I don't know about you, but that was a real challenge. Yeah, that class in particular was a difficult one to sort of figure out how that was going to work online. But I think they caught on pretty quick that just because sports wasn't being played, that there was no sports. I mean, it it just consisted of stories about there not being anything happening on the field. But at the same time, it, it's it been one of the, the more sort of newsy times that I can remember in sports because you've got all these leagues trying to figure out what they're going to look like, what they're going to be. You've got a league in the XFL folding. You've got all these different um, negotiations happening between sort of, you know, owners trying to go back on, on collective bargaining agreements and trying to work out what that's going to look like. You've still got drafts that are done remotely. So there was a huge amount of news, even if there was nothing actually happening on the field. So the, the trick was trying to get students to understand that. And for a class like um, center field, where they're supposed to cover not necessarily games, but kind of game related stories, ideally to kind of get them to, to switch their mindset and say, okay, well now what we're going to cover is there not being any games and what the ramifications of that are and, and how that sort of um, changes the lives of these athletes and coaches. So they came up with some cool stories. Like how do you recruit your next class of, of football players when you can't go see them and, and you can't really um, have, have a physical interaction of, of any kind, or how do you coach a team? How do you keep team chemistry sort of healthy? How do you take care of your players when you can't see them? So the, that was an adjustment, I think, for all of us, but they, they figured it out. So was that a tough adjustment for them, do you think? I think there was just kind of an assumption that, okay, there's no sports, so I guess this class is, you know, maybe we'll do some readings and, and <laughs> whatever. Um, but so they, they, I think they caught on pretty quickly that, you know, when a cataclysm like this happens, it sort of reverberates through everything. And, and because sports is everything and because sports is intertwined with every single part of our society, that it's actually kind of a perfect little microcosm to tell the story of this pandemic through. It's been interesting. Yeah. Because you, you mentioned how this is, there's no sports, but there's been no shortage of sports content, which is kind of interesting. I think we all, a lot of us in sports media kind of had this weird little existential panic in March of what are we going to do? And there's been plenty to do and there's been plenty to, to talk about and write about without, I've been, I think one thing that's impressive for me is without kind of exhausting those typical feature stories that you would see like how athletes are spending their time and you know on this there's been a lot of I think interesting creativity around sports media and kind of reflected in some of the stuff our students did too it it sort of forced you to be creative I mean it's it's funny because I I have two jobs I I teach at Marist and I'm a, a, a soccer columnist at Yahoo Sports and somehow I was busier than ever between getting classes online and and getting that going and and 
which is a lot more work <laughs> than walking into a room and, and talking for an hour and engaging and grading and having some meetings. Um, but so between that and, and the, the other job, you know, where all of a sudden we had to figure out very new ways of, of telling stories because there's no, uh, there's no games to cover and you kind of have to put more work into finding something to finding the news and finding something to talk about. Um, we were, we were busier than ever in, in, in a way, but I think having a wrench thrown at them like this for students is a really valuable experience. Um, partly because I think, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that we now just live in an age of pandemics and that, you know, a first brush with that and how to handle that during college is actually really useful and educational, but also, you know, so much of journalism and and so much of learning what journalism is 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 understanding that things change all the time and the conditions in which you do your job change all the time it's it's a very volatile industry as as i don't think i have to explain to anybody and and so to have that kind of formative experience early on while you're still learning what the trade is is useful Mm-hmm. That that uh, teaching of flexibility, I think, and creativity is super valuable. I think you know it's not just you can't rely on things being normal. You can't rely on games and that ability to to I hate the word pivot because it's overused in media circles, but uh, that ability to be agile and be able to work around and you know figure out a solution to this. You know, there's no sports. What do you do? And be able to to get over that hump and create stuff. So, had you ever taught online before all this? I had not. That okay. was a that was a whole new experience. Uh, what was that like for you? Um, it was really different. So, this semester I was teaching an honor seminar on American sports literature, um, where basically it was just me and and eighteen students, and we read these these six sort of classic sports books, um, and. That and then we we talk about them in class. It was pretty straightforward. We moved that onto Discord, which is a uh, gaming sort of gaming community platform, I would say. And we just turned it into basically a big group chat, and that worked really well. Um, other classes aren't so easy. I had a lecture class, sport culture communication, um, and I'm I'm used to just kind of standing in front of the class and I'll talk about something for half an hour and I'll show lots of videos and pictures and. And then we'll we'll have a discussion or a group activity or something. And that was that was much harder to translate that online. So I kind of mm-hmm. been tinkering with the format, and I wound up just kind of writing out my lectures and then having them do do forum posts and everything. And I'm not sure that worked as well as it possibly could have. Um, I'd, I'd revisit that, but you know, it's it's we were discouraged from having synchronous learning because not everyone has you know not all internet connections are created equal. Not everybody is in, not everybody's in the same time zone. Not everybody's in the same kind of environment. Not everybody's able to do that. So we were trying to be as inclusive as possible um, by avoiding making students sit in front of their computers at a certain time. Um, so we, we weren't supposed to do that. Um, so that was, that one was, was a lot trickier classes like the sports reporting class and the center field class. We eventually kind of figured out where most of that class was me kind of, for sports reporting, you know, explaining how to write a column, what a rough structure is for a column, what makes something a column, et cetera. You can do that fairly well remotely um, and then assign something. And then with the center field class, mostly what our classes boiled down to when we met in person was having an editorial meeting and coming up with stories. So we could do that from afar too. So it was, it was really a mixed bag. I think some classes worked better than others, but it was, it was educational. That's for sure. That's interesting that you use discord. I had one of my students or a student I don't, uh, at my school suggest using that as a, as a platform. And I haven't, but it seems like it's a really potentially powerful platform to use for kind of like not just teaching, but like teaching, thinking of it as like an online community almost rather than like the, the, I don't know, we use Blackboard. I don't know what your learning system is, but they're all very kind of like awful and hierarchical <laughs> and very grade centric. And so I feel like discord and stuff like that is much more, much more suited to a discussion based situation or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's important to meet your students where they are. And a lot of them were already on Discord because I could see sort of when I'd log in to kind of read their posts and, and read their contributions to the discussion and said, so-and-so is, is playing 
um, whatever, League of Legends, and so-and-so is playing this thing. So you could see that they're already on there, and they sort of had it linked to, to whatever games they play. I'm not a big gamer, so I'm probably getting those wrong. But um, the it, it made it really fluid, and I think it made it feel a little bit less like school and more like a community. I mean, it helped that it was a class that they were really into and that they sort of had to, um, you know, not battle exactly but it wasn't the easiest class to, to get into so they were sort of they were keen on that class which is a, a good head start to have um but i i really liked how loose the format became and you know you could use emojis and and you could kind of give someone a a, a it wasn't called a poke but something like that where you, you could you could give someone a nudge and things like that um so it made it really informal which is kind of how i like to teach anyway um because it's it's it was just a lot easier to, to retain their attention when in, instead of having a format where we were, we would have a discussion, you know, over that hour and 15 minute class period, um, two times a week, instead of that, I'd made 48 hour windows. So I'd say, okay, so instead of the Tuesday class, we have mo all of Monday and Tuesday for you to, to post. Um, instead of the Thursday class, you have all of Wednesday and Thursday. And so whenever it was sort of convenient to them, whenever they finished the reading, um, they could sort of go over what everybody else had said, chime in, and kind of that got a really good dialogue going. So it sort of felt like the the less structure there was to it in in that sense, the the lower the the barriers to entry, um, the better they did with it. So so that was really revelatory to me. That's interesting. Uh, you mentioned how along with teaching, you also write a column for Yahoo Sports, and I'm wondering how much. Uh, is your teaching, especially in the sports writing courses, how much is that in, is informed by the fact that you're still doing this, that you're still a columnist and maybe vice versa is your columnist or your columns affected by your teaching at all? Oh, I, I think it's, it's everything. I mean, I, I consider them, you know, they, they are separate jobs, but in so many ways they're, they're intertwined. I mean, just in the practical sense, being in the industry still, as I've been for 10 years, I, I came up with ESPN.com. Um, then I, for, I was there for two and a half years, a little bit longer. And then I was with Fox Sports for uh, two and a half years. And I've been at Yahoo for five and a half years almost now. Um, and so, you know, that's where I came from. I'm, I'm very much an accidental academic, uh, mm -hmm. which, which is a, a whole other discussion. Um, but, you know, being in the industry, knowing how it works, knowing what things are, are like right now and being able to impart that and, and, you know, my classes are very much about trying to make my students plug and play when they graduate where, you know, nobody in the business has time to train anybody. Nobody really has time to teach you anything. When you come out of school, you need to be ready to go. Whatever level it is that, that you hook on, um, you need to be ready to do a job because otherwise there, I don't know that there is going to be a job for you. So I try as much as possible to get my students ready for the jobs that they're after. And so doing that job yourself is, is hugely helpful because I think that makes what I'm teaching them current. Um, at the same time, I think when they sign up for my class, they're also signing up for my connections and, and my network within the industry. Um, and I try where I can to, to get them, whether it's a source for a story or it's an internship that they're trying to go after or it's someone they admire and they'd like to have a connection to. I think being in the business really helps me with um, being a bit of a bridge for my students to get there as well. I'm, I'm lucky we also have a center for sports communication on campus that's run by the great Jane McManus, uh, recently of ESPN and still a columnist for the New York Daily News, and she very much does the same thing. Um, and so in that sense, the, the columnist job and the teaching job are aligned, um, but it, it works the other way as well. I find myself, I've become better at my writing job, or I'd like to think anyway, some commenters might disagree, but, um, since I've started teaching, because it's really forced me to think very deeply about what makes a story work, what makes a column compelling, what makes a gamer more than just, oh, a game happened between team X and team Y, what, you know, which is such an outdated format. Um, how do you how do you get it to really pop? How do you make it a story that adds to what somebody saw when he watched the game or when she had the highlights on her phone and the box score and whatever? So just kind of breaking down structures of of columns that work well uh, for students has also kind of made me um, reassess how I write them in in the uh, in the Yahoo part of my life yeah I found that too like when I write now I can hear what I've said to students in my own head and being like well that's or, or 
that's like don't structure well or think through the structure or yeah you know you, you kind of hear yourself teaching your teaching your students as you're as you're writing yourself um so i'd love to get into that accident accidental academic uh path so <laughs> what was your career path how did you get to where you are right now so the only thing i'd ever wanted to be was a sports writer um you know i decided when i was 14 15 i was probably wasn't good enough to be an athlete. So, which it was extremely true as it turns out. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, all right, what's the next best thing? Well, I'd like to write, okay, sports writer, done. Let's go do that. Um, then I was lucky that I actually became that. I, I, I'm from the Netherlands. I grew up in Belgium. Um, I went to college in London and um, at uh, City University, which is part of University of London now, studied journalism. And while I was there, I did all three of my internships, I believe, at The Guardian, um, which is the only place I applied to because I was an arrogant little brat. And I was like, it's The Guardian or, or bust, <laughs> even though I was obligated for my course to do um, internships. So if I hadn't gotten them, I don't know what I would have done, but whatever. Um, so I was on the sports desk at The Guardian as an intern, and that went well. And then um, I went to grad school at American University and coming out of that, I, I somehow hooked on with UPI, which was still somewhat of a thing um, as a press, as a wire service and the Washington Times, believe it or not, as their Brussels correspondents moved back to, to Brussels or I was a stringer really, it was kind of glorified correspondent um, and covered NATO in the EU. And then we moved back stateside and I couldn't get hired for the worst jobs in the industry um, and then ESPN decided that, you know, six months before this, uh, the 2010 World Cup, which um, the, he wasn't quite the president yet, I think, but John Skipper, who would run ESPN for a long time, had made this huge bet on. Uh, and so they decided that for the first time in company history, they were going to hire full-time soccer writers. And I was actually the first one hired. So, uh, you know, I could not get some of the worst jobs. I won't identify them exactly, but I couldn't get any of these terrible jobs. And then suddenly ESPN hired me. It's like, all right. Um, as, as its first soccer writer for ESPN.com. And so, like I said, I did that for a while. Um, then after the 2014 world cup, which I covered for Fox, I went to South Africa for ESPN. Uh, so I went to uh, Brazil for Fox. And after that, a buddy of mine, um, who I played pickup soccer with, he taught at Marist. And he asked if I wanted to come talk to his class about mega events. Yeah, sure. I'll come talk. And then after that, I really liked that. I enjoyed that. After that, I got asked if I wanted to adjunct to class, uh, sports reporting. I said, yeah, sure. We'll, I'll give it a try. I had a friend, a good friend who'd sort of transitioned from sports writing to, um, to being an academic. And, and it seemed like he really liked it and he kind of had it figured out and it was a better work-life balance for him. Um, and so I adjuncted a class and then another class and then another class. And then I kind of took a break from it for a while because we were having a baby. Um, my wife did all the work, but anyway, mm. I'll, I'll take credit for it. And, <laughs> um, and then uh, Yahoo was about to be bought by Verizon and to become Oath and then Verizon Media. And there was kind of all this insecurity uh, and all this uncertainty. Um, and this job opened up at Marist, a sports communication lecturer job. Um, which seemed right for me. So that's how I got it. So, you know, a, a college that happens to be 25 minutes up the road, which is so unusual in, in academia that you get to actually take a job that's right by you and you don't have to move. Um, the, the, you know, there was no PhD required or anything like that. And, and it just kind of was a good fit. And I, I really like teaching and I wouldn't want to do anything else anymore. And, and it's, it's put me in a really fortunate position where, I can kind of pick and choose what writing I like to do. I mean, I have a, a sort of, um, I don't want to say full-time because it's not full-time, but I have a steady gig with, with Yahoo Sports. Um, but I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do rather than it being, um, you know, my whole income and, and sort of my, my central way of, of earning a living. So, so it's, it's a really nice mix. I, I highly recommend um, it academia plus sort of a, a thing on the side and in, in whatever your field is, because it kind of takes the pressure off and it makes it a lot easier to enjoy that job, I think. Right. right. So uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, talk to you about was the piece you wrote for Slate. I think it was two weeks ago now. Um, let me want to get the headline right, because it's great. Uh, was Donald Trump good at baseball? Um, spoiler alert, no. Um, 
So um, it's a great piece. It's really inventive. The link is in show notes for this. Um, where did, so where did the idea for you writing this piece come from? So it's funny. Um, so we live in the Hudson Valley now. My wife is from here. Uh, she's from Newburgh. And her uncle had been a baseball star at a tiny private school called the Storm King School, um, which is, you know, about 10 minutes from the New York Military Academy. And my father-in-law had always had this idea that he was going to go down to the local library, go through the microfilm and find all the local uh, newspaper stories about his brother, who had been, again, this, this sort of big baseball star there. And one day he sort of mentions, you know, you know, Trump played there around the same time. He's like, yeah, I, I knew that. He said, I bet you you could find his stories too in, in the local papers. Um, and then it took me an embarrassingly long time to actually follow up on that and to, and to go and take a look because it turned out to be a really good tip. But so in doing a little bit of research, I found all these old quotes from Trump and some of them not so old claiming that he was the best ball player in New York and that he was a pro prospect and that he was, um, that he was a great athlete and all the rest. I'm like, all right, let's, let's go fact check. Um, so it took a little while, but eventually going through this microfilm, I found probably a half dozen old game stories in the microfilm and then on newspapers.com, which is this subscription service that's got these archives of all these old papers. I found another uh, five or six and putting them together, I held all these box scores and it turned out that um, between nine games, which doesn't sound like a lot, but NEMA, uh, the New York Military Academy, only played 10 games a season. So Trump's high school career was only about 30 games that he'd hit 138 um, and that he wasn't nearly the best player on his own team, let alone in the States. Um, and sort of the whole thing started to unravel from there, you know, finding out had he been really been scouted, extremely unlikely. Was he a pro prospect? Absolutely not. Um, it's also notable, by the way, that he's the only president since Teddy Roosevelt, who's not thrown out a first pitch while in office um, at a major league baseball game, which is weird because he has done it before at a Yankee game um, and at a Pawtucket Sox game once, I believe, when he landed his helicopter in center field, um, <laughs> which is very Trumpian. Um, but so the, this whole thing started to come apart and it was just it was all just sitting there in, in the microfilm in this local library. And then I tracked down a bunch of former teammates and, you know, like, like any 70 something guy reminiscing about his, his uh, high school baseball career, they all remembered themselves a little bit better than they were, but none of them were like, Oh yeah, he was, he was a baseball prodigy. He was, he was definitely going to make it. Um, they all said, yeah, he was, he was pretty good. He was a good fielding first baseman. Trump's preferred position was catcher. Um, so he didn't even get to play the position he he actually liked the best because there was always a better catcher on the team. So he played first base um, and he hit sixth, you know, at, at this tiny school at the time, Nima was, was kind of as big as it would ever be. It's down to less than a hundred students now, but between sixth and 12th grade, they had 400 students or something. Um, so it's this mini minuscule school playing a schedule against other tiny schools in the middle of nowhere, you know, this baseball backwater, um, and, and there was really just absolutely nothing there to suggest that, that Trump was a, was a baseball prospect. So, and, and so you start reporting it and then did you pitch it to Slate? Did Slate come to you? Like how, how does it go from this idea and going through the microfilm to then getting published? Well, it's, it sort of bounced around a little bit. Um, but so it, it went to Slate and they have really, really good editors over there. So it went through a few, few more rounds of edits and fact checking. And then we had to go to the white house and be like, Hey, um, you know, the president says he was great at baseball, but everything I found says that he wasn't, what, what do you want to, <laughs> how do you want to respond? Um, and at first they sort of sent me a bunch of links to all these stories that were, that I'd already linked to within the story. Um, that, that said he was good, but the, all, all of the Trump biographies, and there's a bunch of them, they all sort of just took at face value this, this claim that he was a great athlete, um, even though, again, there's no evidence of that. So they said, oh, well, why don't you look at this biography and this biography? And I said, well, yes, but that's the whole thing that I'm trying to debunk. And then eventually a, some kind of press aide went, or at least says he did, went to the president and said, hey, well, how about this? And he came back to me and said, the president has nothing to add. Um, and that's when I got this, this boilerplate quote saying that he was a great athlete and, uh, 
and and that he loves the game of baseball and all the rest. So so that was kind of nerve wracking. But um, yeah, so it, it wound up with Slate and they're really happy to have it. I think it was a good place for it because it's got sort of this reputation of, of you know, going after established narratives and, and finding out if, if they're actually true. Um, so, so that was a good home for the story. It, were you, so as you're reporting this, like the idea that Trump was a good athlete and a good baseball player, I mean, I think I mentioned it to my wife that you had written this piece and she's like, no, without even looking at it, she doesn't even know baseball. Like it's kind of, kind yes. of self evident I think, especially to those of us on the political left that he obviously wasn't. Is it, were you, surprised at what you found at all or did anything kind of you know in, in terms of kind of balancing off what we think we're gonna you think you're gonna find on this versus what you actually found in your reporting so i i think there's there's two pieces to that um to kind of touch on something you said i really did intend to honestly you know i i have my own political views and this is also what i told the the former teammates that i spoke to some of whom are very very strong trump supporters others of whom aren't so much. Um, you know, I said, I just want to find out the truth. It's, it's just this little piece in, in this very important man, for, for better or worse, um, in his past that hasn't really been explored. I mean, he spent five or six years at NEMA, and it was a really pivotal time in his life, and we know almost nothing about it. Uh, but here's something that, that we can probably find out, right? Because like every other school he went to, his his uh, academic and, and school records were hidden. Um, and so I said, you know, if, if I find, find out that he really was a great ball player, that's what I'll write because that's, that's what the truth will be. Um, so, so that was one part of it. Um, the, the other part was, I think that this isn't, so it turns out to be a lie, right? This isn't just another quotidian political lie. This isn't just, you know, lying about hydroxychloroquine or whatever. This is something foundational to the kind of uh, origin story that he tells to, to kind of this cult of personality that he built around himself, that he's a success. He's a winner. He always has been. He's always been good at everything. He's special. He can't, he can't be beaten. He can't lose. Right. Um, so it felt like going back to something like this, that you can easily lie about because, well, who's going to check? Oh, well, me, as it turns out. Um, that it, it, was, it was more than just, you know, another, another obfuscation or another lie from, from behind some podium with a presidential seal on it. So it felt important for that reason to kind of go after this. And a lot of the comments I, get after the, I got after the story ran were, why would you look into this? Don't you have anything better to do? I was like, well, no, actually... I think this is an important thing to look into. I think the stories that people tell about themselves and how they got to be who they are are important to fact check when when you mm -hmm. become someone important down the line. Right. Um, I'm, I was going to ask you about the feedback on it. Um, and actually, what have you gotten? What's the feedback been like compared the the Trump story versus the Jordan column that you wrote the <laughs> other day? So this is an interesting one. Um, so I wrote this column the other day uh, for Yahoo. Um, that's annoyed an awful lot of people. It's a great column, about, by the way. Oh, thank you. So basically, that the thing that The Last Dance, the, the Big Jordan documentary taught me is that Be Like Mike was not something that you should actually want to be like. Mm -hmm. He seemed like a now and then sort of a truculent, petty man who, who has basketball and only basketball and who sort of consumed not just by a competitiveness, but something that goes a lot further. He was a bully. He was someone who mistreated his teammates routinely. And the, the Jordan brand, the, the, his own cult of personality is kind of built around this idea that that's what made Jordan Jordan. And that's what made him good. And that's what made the Bulls so good. And I just don't buy that. I think that the Bulls were good in spite of that part of his personality. And, and in spite of who the, this drive that he had that goes so far past, you know, trying to be great and trying to make everybody else great. And that's just outright abuse. Um, and that, you know, the, the kind of this Michael Jordan exceptionalism, if you look at it closely, it doesn't really hold up. It's, it's, it seems like his teammates were miserable being on that team with him and there was very little joy. And I don't actually believe that it made them better, but what do I know? At any rate, 
Um, I got a lot of feedback on that. There was some Fox Sports radio guy I saw a link to yesterday. I had spent a whole six minutes whining about it on air. Um, <laughs> and basically dismissing me on account that I'm actually a soccer writer, even though I do lots of non-soccer stuff, but whatever. Um, but to the Trump story, there was shockingly little pushback um, from his defenders or from the right. And my theory, and maybe it, it flatters me a little bit, but I won't let that get in the way, um, is that um, it's because I think the story was unassailable. You can quibble with the arguments that I made in the Jordan uh, column because they were arguments, because they were, that was my point of view, and that's how I look at it. And I, I think Jordan is the embodiment of toxic masculinity, and that, you know, prizing toughness over consideration is kind of what got us into this mess in the first place, and et cetera. But with the Trump piece, you know, I had the receipts. I had these teammates, many of whom were Trump supporters, saying, yeah, he was pretty good. I had all these box scores that suggested he wasn't very good at all. Um, and I just kind of had the facts. And if you wanted to call that fake news, then what that was essentially implying was that a bunch of local papers in the 1960s were conspiring against the future political career of a high school baseball player, <laughs> right? That, it, was, it was a very hard thing to refute. Um, so I think that that's why um, it, it didn't get a whole lot of pickup. I mean, there were a few sort of right-wing websites like the, the Free Beacon that, that kind of tried to um, go off, tee off on it. I mean, one of them literally said, why isn't Obama mentioning this story? Um, <laughs> well, it wasn't about Obama. Obama didn't say that he was the best high school baseball player in the States. But um, so in, in that sense, it was, it was sort of funny where I thought that there'd be a lot of pushback and a lot of hate to the Trump story, but it seems like anybody who saw it uh, preferred to just kind of ignore it and not give it oxygen and try to make it go away because I don't know how much you could really argue against it. Yeah, the Jordan thing is so interesting. I heard um, Brandon McCarthy on a podcast this morning say that um, that Jordan drive like the 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 attitude he has it's like it's not exceptional like he's been he's he's been on he played major league baseball for a long time it's like there's five guys on every team who have that kind of attitude and that kind of view and and that kind of you know mindset it's just Michael Jordan had that plus was ungodly talented so it was kind of right you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't that that made Jordan great. It was the talent that made him great. But I just, I just find that. And, I, and I've written about this too on my blog that like all like it's such, it's become a trope in sports writing. He's so competitive. He won't let his kids win at ping pong. He like, you play a game and he slams it. Right. And, and I'm like, and that's always talked about in this way of praise. And I'm like, if you did that on a game night, you would never be invited back. You're like the <laughs> horrible person to do that. It's such a weird weird trait that sports media has traditionally celebrated when it's when you look at it with like any kind of like normalized view it's like that's a terrible thing to celebrate at the expense of celebrating you know work ethic it's celebrating you know all these other things that maybe you could celebrate about yeah. about them yeah no i i don't i don't get it and maybe i mean a, a lot of the negative um, feedback that I've gotten as well. You don't understand because you've never won anything and, and you never played sports, which I did. And we actually did win a high school basketball championship, but whatever. I, I don't want to poke that bear necessarily. Um, and it also kind of misses the point because there have been an awful lot of people who've won an awful lot of things um, who weren't like that. You know, nobody's ever said of Tim Duncan that he was an abusive teammate or you know, there's, there's a lot of examples you could find, probably more examples of transcendent athletes who won lots and lots of things who weren't the way Jordan is than um, those that were. I, I just don't buy this, this whole thing. I, I truly believe that the Bulls won and were that good in spite of Michael Jordan's um, treatment of his teammates rather than because of it. So I ask everybody I have on the podcast this, so I'll ask you, what's the best thing that you've read lately? Oh, um, oh, you know what? I just finished reading Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. Oh, that's a uh, great pick. I'm, I'm kind of catching up on some, uh, I, I had some, um, a little bit of my Marist budget left last year. And so what I did is I went through the uh, Sports Illustrated all-time top 50 sports books. 
and I bought everything that, that I didn't have yet. Oh, nice. <laughs> Um, so I'm just kind of working my way through that. So I just finished that. And that was a, that was a book that, that really knocked me on my rear end. So I want to, I, 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 kind of in this vein, the six books that you had, uh, your students read for that class, the six classics, what were they? Um, let's see, we started with Friday night lights, of course. Then we went to eight men out, which was kind of interesting because big parts of that book were fabricated. Right. <laughs> um, and so kind of getting into that with the students, like after they finished, like, okay, now let me tell you something. No, this character and this character and this character didn't actually exist. Um, so, so that made for fun discussions. Um, let's see. We read Moneyball. We read Among the Thugs. Uh, that's four. We read Little Girls in Pretty Boxes. And we read... Um, don't, don't blank, Leander. Don't blank. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, Friday Night Lights, Moneyball, Among the Thugs, Little Girls in Pretty Boxes, Eight Men Out, and... Yeah, I'm going to blank on the last one. That's terrible. But we, we also actually had um, the authors of three of the books uh, Skype into the, into the class. Which oh, really awesome. Cool. That's so great. we had Buzz Bissinger Skyped in, uh, Bill Buford, uh, who wrote Among the Thugs Skyped in, and Joan mm-hmm. Ryan, who wrote Little Girls in Pretty Boxes, uh, she Skyped in too. So, so that was great. Oh, that's awesome. What, what book, was there a book that the students really responded to that kind of surprised you? Yeah, they none of them had read Friday Night Lights. Most of them had read Moneyball, uh, which is kind of a generational divide. So, so they liked that. They really loved Friday Night Lights, but they really responded to uh, Little Girls in Pretty Boxes, which that book had been sort of on the bubble for me, but I really wanted to have A, a book that was about women's sports and, and B, a book that was written by a woman to kind of diversify a little bit. Um, so, so they, they really responded to that because so much of that still rings true now. Um, you know, the, the themes of Larry Nasser is in that book, you know, I mean, even if it's in the, the, uh, captions to the pictures, but so much of what we later found out about the abusive, um, nature of gymnastics really resonated with them. So, so that was, um, that was gratifying to see. All right, Leander, this has been great. Enjoy your summer off. I hope it's you know somewhat more relaxing than this semester has been and I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This was fun. As always, thanks for listening to The Other 51. You can find show notes for this episode and all our episodes at sportsmediaguide.com on The Other 51 tab. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. I can highly recommend Overcast for this. Our theme music is by Ellie Moritz. 